had my brother in my hand, and all of a sudden, my hand was empty. Xavier is now eight. We call him X. He is to us the mighty X man, yes. X as a little person from the time that he hit the floor in the morning until you had to forcefully to almost tie him down at night. He was running back and forth, back and forth, extremely energetic. He could call football plays. He loved the Green Bay Packers. I could turn the game on and sit him in front of it and do house chores. You know, most people sit their babies in front of Sesame Street. I could sit X in front of a game. He would have been an excellent athlete. I was always looking forward to being in the stand screaming X, 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 X. That was mom's dream, to be screaming from a football stand. He's just arriving from school now. I got to have him back. I got to know how school went. I got to know today's Friday, so I need to know if he got 106 on his spelling test, which he almost always does. X is paralyzed from the diaphragm down. In the accident, part of his spinal cord was dissipated. His legs are gone. His chair are his legs now. The use of his right hand is partial. He woke up actually from the coma a lefty. He went in a righty. She missed his brain stem by that much. X is on life support. The ventilator has to breathe for my son. Most nights, I'm here on the couch, listening for the ventilator, listening to making sure that all the breaths are right, that his peep on his doesn't change, that he doesn't need suctioning during the night. I hear everything. I hear everything. I can hear the ventilator change cycles. I can hear just the breath sounds different and run down the stairs and the nurse goes, he's good, mom, he's good. Boy, you got good ears. There are times when the pain is so bad, I can't breathe. I want to say the worst thing that I can't say to X, which I used to be able to say all the time, go in the yard and play. I can't say that anymore. Because if we go play, we need to take the suction machine. We need to transfer him over to the ventilator for his chair. Before we can do anything, we need to do that first. It's a, it's, it's a production. I can't say go play. Any mother understands. I can't say go play. He comes to life when she comes in the room. X doesn't remember as well as both Ari and I do, but Ari was walking across the street with Xavier on that October day. We pray that that never happens to another brother or sister. We pray that another child doesn't get taken from a family member's hand. 
she came from this direction. And at first, we didn't even see her. The cars on the other side of the stop sign. They stepped off the curb, coming across the street, and Ari said he was gone. She took him from Ari's hand. She was not only speeding in the school zone, but she had also run the stop sign because she was texting. The lady who hit X was texting. Texting. She, her head was in her lap. She never even saw X in front of her. She actually came straight through the stop sign. There were no brake marks, no skid marks at all. She never stopped at a four-way stop sign. She never stopped. You know, I'm told that the text was, I'm on my way. Did she make it? Did she get to where she was going on time? That would be my question for her. I feel like it was just a dream. And for, for weeks it did. It felt like I'd wake up and I'd just think, right, did, I, did I dream that accident? I'm just a guy, you know, I'm just a young guy. I got a wife, you know, a daughter on the way. I'm just a guy. This couldn't happen to me, that can't be real. You know, I had to have just dreamed that. Memories, you know, what you saw that day, um, you know, they come back at different points. You know, I'll maybe be somewhere and I'll see um, an Amish family or I'll see an Amish and it'll bring back memories of the accident. This was the last text message I sent before I caused an accident that killed three people. The Amish family was on their way um, eight o'clock in the morning that day. And then the, uh, the, the van was driven by a young man from Bluffton, uh, Chandler Gerber. Um, he was on the way to a job. Um, he cleaned carpets at the time. Um, and he was traveling about the speed limit we determined he was in speeding or anything like that, just traveling along. And he overtook the Amish right there, right just where about my car is, and basically hit the Amish buggy from behind and, and just ended up all the way uh, from, from the point where my car is here. It's about 400 feet, 430 feet where he ended up, where, where the van ended up. I was heading east, um, right into the sunrise. Um, driving along. As I was driving, um, I was texting back and forth uh, with my wife. I was texting and I think I was, I was reading a text back at the time of the accident because I remember driving and like my head just snapped up when I, I saw, you know, the windshield just glass broke and, and screeching and my head, you know, it happened in about a second. I mean, I had a thousand thoughts going through my mind. As I started coming to a, a stop, I saw, you know, a body come down from off the top of the, the van. Um, and I just thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? I just thought, what have I done? And I realized, you know, I had hit something and, and I realized it was an Amish buggy. I jumped out of the van, totally silent outside the van. At that second in time, there was nobody else coming or going. I walked around back and I looked 
in the ditch, and there was bodies just laying there. Um, I just, I mean, it was just silent. It was just quiet. The only, the only sound I heard, the only thing I saw moving was the horse. It was severely wounded. Um, it was just kind of moving around on the ground a little bit. I remember, um, the mother was laying, I believe, it was face down on her hands and knees, like like she had been sitting on a chair. Um, and it just like the force just hit her, and she just didn't have time to move. You know, she was just sitting in that same position on the ground. And I just remember staring. And nobody else was around, just me and the family that was laying in the ditch and the horse and just silence. You had all kinds of chaos here. This is the uh, van that was driven by Chandler Gerber. Uh, as you can see, the front of the vehicle is just totally smashed here. He was devastated. Uh, he was crying. Um, he was uh, just in, in, almost in a panic mode. I knew that I had been texting and driving. I knew that I had been around that time, you know, involved with reading my phone or texting or, or what have you. I was hysterical. I was, I think I, I was probably in shock. I was sitting in a van in the passenger seat, taking in, as far as I could see straight ahead, just lights and sirens and people. And I saw a hearse drive by. And so right then I just had this sinking feeling um, that there was at least one one dead dead person. They took two two young children. It was a three year old and a five year old. They took a seventeen year old son. I saw the youngest of the children, three year old Enos. Um, I it he was laying face down in the ditch, right here, just to our side, right, right behind, uh, right in front of me here, actually. Um, he looked like he was asleep until we rolled him over and we saw the injuries to his face. Uh, injuries to his legs looked like they were both broken. Um, it, was, it was very devastating. Um, Shortly after the accident, it was pretty rough. A lot of tears, a lot of, why did this happen? This note was from uh, Martin Schwartz, the father of the children that had passed away uh, from my accident. It says, Dear ones, trusting in God's ways, how does this find you? Hope all in good health and in good cheer. Around here, we are all on the go and try to make the best we can. I always wonder if we take enough time with our children. Wishing you the best with your little one in the unknown future. I think of you often. Keep looking up. God is always there. Sincerely, Martin and Mary Schwartz. I just, I wish, I wish so bad I could go back to that day and change my focus. I wish I could go back and say, you know, I, I can do these texts when I, when I get to my stop, you know, when I get there. I don't have to do this right now while I'm driving. Um, you know, there's just nothing that important. Um, but at that point, you know, it was just, you know, oh, I can text and drive, it's no big deal. Um, and it is a big deal. Please, please don't do it. Please don't, don't ever text and drive. It's life. You get one chance and you live with the choices you make. She has no life, really. Her balance is off. Her arms don't work very well. She likes to watch the boats going up and down the river and 
She's got double vision. She can't see very well. It's very hard for her. She cannot leave this yard. We put up a fence in her backyard so she wouldn't roll down the bank into the river. She loves feeding her bird, taking care of the wildlife that comes around. She had her life planned. She was always planning everything. Now she can't plan anything because she can't remember anything. Debbie was very active, outgoing. She worked 60 plus hours a week. She held a very good position traveling all over the world, going to Istanbul, Turkey, traveling to France, and loving working for her job. And they love Debbie very, very much. Now she is dependent on everybody, myself, my brother, friends, she cannot go into the front of the yard by herself because her vision. I don't remember anything about the accident. From when I was told, I was bringing my least dog for work for the last time and not before I went to bed. Well, it was a Sunday night, August the 7th, approximately 9.15. My sister had come out of her house to um, get her mail by the big pine tree. She was struck by a teenager texting and driving. The white mailbox is where my sister was struck. It was carried on the hood of the car to right over here. And this is where the neighbors found her. When she was in the hospital, she was swollen from head to toe. She had a shunt sticking out of her head right here to relieve pressure in her brain because her brain was so swollen. Her eyes, her right eye was swollen shut. Her face was swollen. Her neck was broken. Both her arms were broken. Ribs were broken. Her pelvis was smashed. She had a broken ankle and a broken leg. Her thumb ripped off almost ripped off. They sewed it back together. Um, it was terrible. It was heartbreaking. She was in her coma, and I went up to her, and I started talking to her. And I had her hand, and she squeezed my hand. She knew I was there. And I told her, I said, Debbie, I know you're in there. I know you can't talk or anything, but I know you're in there. And she gave me another squeeze on my hand. She knew that I was talking to her. She could feel it. Her sentence was 30 days in jail. She's got five months of house arrest, 500 hours of community service, and that's about it. My sister doesn't want anything to do with her. She's too angry right now. And I don't, I don't think that anger is gonna go away anytime soon. Charlie is the big chocolate lab right here. He was 11 years old when he was killed. Charlie was about 115 pounds. No, he was about 105. 105 pounds. Charlie was my best friend. He was so, so lovely, he's so lovable. We're working on my sister and somebody said, where's Debbie's dog? And that's when the search went out and they found him over here in the trees. The mailbox had been knocked, the blue mailbox had been knocked down. Um, we think that he was thrown through the air and knocked that mailbox down. Um, he took the full force of the car. He laid on the side of the road. The neighbors told us, wagging his tail. while Debbie was being loaded up in the ambulance. It's just not right. My sister's life has been changed forever. She went from being active to inactive in a stroke of a second, and it's over. Her life as she knew it is over. She loved work. 
she helped me with my children. She was always there for me. It's heartbreaking every day to see my sister like this when you knew how she was before. I know. I'm very fond of telescopes. It's just a reminder of my father and the good times that we used to have. The telescope's just another way that I look at him being a scientist and the brilliant man he was. At night, we would go outside and look at the stars, and he would tell me the different constellations, help me learn them. When there were meteor showers, he'd come and wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and take me outside and we'd just stare and watch the meteor showers for hours. It was just me and my dad outside, wrapped up in blankets. It was just a phenomenal feeling, just good father-daughter time for us. That's the best father I could have ever asked for. Yeah, growing up, I was pretty typical. Um, played a lot of sports growing up, played basketball, played football, um, played baseball, ran track. I'm quiet on the phone, I'm awkward on the phone. I'm, uh, you know, I, I have always preferred to, to text or to talk in person. I'm a cowboy, I guess, and I'm a child of the mountains. I recently took a trip in, out on the prairie and it was pretty, but I'm, I'm a child of the mountains and I need mountains around me. I'm, every morning I can get up and watch the sun come up over this mountain to the east. It's a beautiful mountain watch the sun go down in the west over another pretty mountain. And so I'm not much into technology. As a blacksmith, all your problems can be solved with a bigger hammer, you know, more heat and a bigger hammer. And so I'm not much of a technology guy, and I never have liked texting, and since that day I've liked it even less. I text often, um, you know, daily, I keep in touch with friends and family. The car doing the texting was going this direction. The two call engineers were heading out this way. And, and as they passed, they, they brushed each other, which spun the little blue car with the thigh call engineers, spun it around this way into the path of an oncoming pickup. There's about a 15 or 16 mile stretch of Highway 30 going to Logan. And from the time we started on that stretch of road, headed towards Logan, the, the driver ahead of me was distracted. I did notice that. He was he crossed over the center line multiple times. It was early in the morning. Um, it was uh, still fairly dark outside, and the, it, was, it was raining pretty bad. And on my way to work, I'm, I'm texting and reading messages, and I go across the center line, and, and I hit another car. I don't remember what I was texting. Um, I don't remember what the message said. That's how important it was. And I saw him cross over the center line. And at that moment, things kind of go into slow motion and you, you could just see that. And I thought, man, this is gonna be bad. I remember the sound of the cars hitting, glass breaking, brakes and, and tires squealing. He just sideswiped it and sent it into a skid and, and I had the definite recollection of thinking to myself that, you know, I, I knew right then that I was going to collide with that car, and I just thought, oh, this is going to be bad, you know, I just, I knew right then and there, and, and it just, the question in my mind was how bad was it going to be, and, and my, my truck um, hit the passenger side of the car, and basically scooped the car up and carried it off into the ditch with us as we were, you know, I, I had braked and was trying to get stopped and avoid it, and obviously I couldn't. My pickup went halfway through that car. I got out of my car, I, I ran back towards the accident, and um, there was a, 
a man on the phone. I, I heard him say um, that there were two men in the car that, that weren't breathing. The two people that were killed were inside the blue car. This other one shows what the car, car looked like after the accident. Look at that picture. <laughs> it's all I can think about is, is those families. Those two men. And while I was driving, I decided that texting and driving was more important to me than those two men were to their families. And how selfish that was of me to make that decision to text and drive. Knowing every day that you killed two people is one of the hardest things that you could live with. I have night terrors all the time about my dad's car accident that come in waves of, it can be just me standing on the side of the freeway where it happened, just watching the accident happen and not being able to move, I can't go try and stop the accident from happening. I can't go see if my father's okay. I can't save my father. I'm just standing on the side of the road. I can't do anything. Two, I've been Reggie. This is the one texting while driving that hits the car. Just being the one that causes the accident. And two, I've been the driver of the truck that T-boned my dad. Just sitting in the seat, just killing my own father. Ended up with some herniated discs in my back and um, my knees took a pretty big beating in the dash and you know how much of the damage to them was from the accident, I don't know, but um, Horseshoeing is a very physical occupation. It's hard on your back anyway, and to suddenly end up with some herniated discs, you know, your, your life of the horseshoer is over. <laughs> it's been uh, almost seven years in September, and it is still very difficult for me. That accident was preventable. There was, there's, there's no other way to look at it. Um, I put my phone away and I saved those two men's lives. Um, and it's, it's that simple, it's that simple for me now looking back. Um, and when I speak to others, I, I share the same message. I say, now it's, it's that easy for you going forward to save someone's life. You put the phone away when you drive and you're, you're safer behind the wheel and everyone else is safer on the road around you. I, I want people to, to look at me and look at what I did and what I caused and say, I, I don't want to be that guy. First time I saw Reggie in court, he, my feelings was, it was just sheer hatred. 
I was appalled at the fact that this kid my age had killed my dad, taken him away from me. On my sentencing date, and the families had the chance to get up and, and address me and, and speak to me. And All I could do was just look at him and hate him and wish how much he would die or that it was him that was dead instead of my dad. Megan got up and uh, she talked about her, her wedding. And she had just gotten married and um, she talks about how her father wasn't there to walk her down the aisle. And she looked at me and, and she said, because you, you took that from me. And she was, she was absolutely right. I would like to think that my dad is somewhere in the universe. I go outside at night, sit on my balcony when I'm really upset. I stare at the sky and whenever I'm super upset, I always see a shooting star. And I like to think that that's my way or my dad's way of trying to communicate with me. And I felt that my dad would not have wanted me to be mad at him for the rest of my life. And that he, I knew my dad had forgiven him. I knew that. And that he would want me to try and move on and forgive him and even get to know him. Forgiveness is... That's something that I, I see from Megan. I see that for forgiveness. I feel it. I'm grateful for it. I reached out to Reggie to tell him, you know, I forgive you. My dad forgave you. I want to help you through your, you know, trying to make a difference in this whole thing. I was once told that to be a good member of society, you have to give back more than you take. I can never give back those two men's lives, ever. I would just like to say, um, for anybody out there who has a cell phone, um, focus while you're driving, pay attention while you're driving, don't take your eyes off the road while you're driving. Things can happen so quick that'll change your life forever. I will say it over and over and over again. Don't text and drive. That it can't wait. I would tell America to please don't text and drive. How many other people are going to have to be killed? How many other people are going to be left like my sister, Debbie? It's just nuts. It's crazy, you know. I don't know why people don't want to talk to each other anyway. 